Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome again to this symposium on multiple myeloma cases. So, I'd like you to pay attention because there's going to be a post-test, and we'd <laughs> like you to really get a 100% score so that we are going to look good, and that's really ma <laughs> that matters. <laughs> All right, well, let's start with the basic. What is multiple myeloma? Well, when a patient is diagnosed with multiple myeloma, they are often confused and they haven't heard the word multiple myeloma. Why? Because multiple myeloma is one of the rare types of cancer. It only accounts for about 1% of all hematologic malignancies. And roughly um, in 2018, there's about 31,000 cases newly diagnosed with myeloma compared to the 200, over 200,000 cases when it comes to breast cancer or over 180,000 uh, cases when it comes to lung cancer. So when we take care of a myeloma patients newly diagnosed with myeloma, we need to go with the basic first. Let's start with multiple myeloma is a cancer of the plasma cells. And again, that word, two words, plasma cell, are not common words, so we have to follow it up that plasma cells are part of the immune system. In normal people, plasma cells are the cells that are responsible in producing immunoglobulins. These immunoglobulins are called G, A, M, D, and E, and they are polyclonal immunoglobulin. When I say polyclonal, it means that it comes from different types of plasma cell, and that's the production of polyclonal immunoglobulin. That's the normal situation. What happens in multiple myeloma is that there's one cell that became uncontrolled and multiplied in millions. And therefore, it produ they, these cells produce one type of immunoglobulin, and that's what we call the monoclonal protein, or M-spike. This is a very important concept in multiple myeloma because this is the tumor marker for multiple myeloma. I always say to my patients, if there's one damn good thing about multiple myeloma is that this myeloma cells make protein. And because of that, we can trace and we can track their number of growth and proliferation by using the M spike as our tumor marker. Unlike in lymphoma, you have to track the lymph nodes. So that's what is what makes myeloma a lot easier to track. We have a biomarker that can be taken from the patient's blood. Now, what about the different uh, spectrum of plasma cell disorders? Well, multiple myeloma, we now know, is preceded by, a pre by two premalignant conditions, and they're called MGUS, or monoclonal gammopathy of undetermined significance, and smoldering multiple myeloma. We owe a lot to Dr. Robert Kyle from Mayo Clinic, who did a 60-year longitudinal study on patients with plasma cell disorder, and he described MGUS and smoldering multiple myeloma and active multiple myeloma in a very systematic way of investigating plasma cell discretion disorders. So, what is MGUS? MGUS is a condition that is a pre-malignant state of active multiple myeloma. It has less than 10% of monoclonal plasma cytosis in the bone marrow. There is no evidence of myeloma-defining events, which Dr. Feynman will explain in the next slide. And the likelihood of disease progression is only about 1% per year. So it's really low. We typically just monitor this patient. At the onset of the, of the diagnosis, we tend to see this patient every six months for a year. And if the biomarker, the M spike, the M protein is stable, we only see this patient once a year. This patient with MGUS doesn't require any treatment, just observation and lab test every six months for a year and then once a year thereafter because the chance, again, of progression is very, very low, 1% only. Then we move on to the second spectrum 
of plasma cell discretion, and that is your smoldering multiple myeloma. We give the diagnosis of smoldering multiple myeloma if the bone marrow biopsy of the patient during the diagnostic workup shows 10 to 60 percent. That's def definitely an arbitrary number, but somehow we have to draw the line, right? In order to really pigeonhole the correct diagnosis. So, for the sake of that, smoldering multiple myeloma belongs to that category where the bone marrow plasmacytosis is about 10 to 60 percent. When it comes to myeloma defining events, there's still no evidence of any myeloma defining events for this patient, for this patient who was diagnosed with smoldering multiple myeloma. The likelihood of progression, though, is slightly higher, or at least 10 times higher when it comes to likelihood of progression. And some of this subset of this smoldering multiple myeloma patients are high risk that they even have the probability of having disease progression within two years. And then, and that part will also be covered in a little bit. When it comes to the like, uh, myeloma defining events, there's still no myeloma defining events for this case, and the patient could still be observed. But again, the subset where there is a high risk feature, this group of patients may benefit from the clinical trial. And lastly, the third and the most active form of the spectrum of plasma cell disorder is what we call malignant myeloma or active or symptomatic multiple myeloma. What do we see in this group of patients who get a diagnosis of active, symptomatic, malignant myeloma? Well, number one, anybody who has a 60% or higher plas monoclonal plasma cytosis. You might notice that I keep saying monoclonal because that is a hallmark of multiple myeloma disease. It has to come from one clone. That's why it's monoclonal. Because if it's polyclonal, your patient might have a diagnosis of HIV or other autoimmune diseases. So you have to be very careful when you look at the bone marrow biopsy result of your patient. The final diagnosis line has to say monoclonal plasma cytosis. The, the presence of myeloma-defining events, definitely. And Dr. Feynman will cover that in about two seconds. <laughs> Likelihood of progression, not, a, not applicable, because there's already a myeloma-defining event. The patient needs treatment. And here we go with Dr. Feynman. Okay, thank you. And as, uh, as Joseph had mentioned, there are new criteria since 2014 for those who are defined as myeloma. And look at this slide closely, because this might have been an ARS question, a pretest question. But we have the patients, a lot of people will have abnormal protein, but not need treatment. They might succumb to other illnesses, such as cardiovascular disease, lung cancer, et cetera. But ultimately, ones that have calcium elevation, renal problems, anemia, or damage to one's bones are likely to, re are, will, not are likely, they will require treatment. And he highlighted, Dr. Terriman, the different bone marrow clonal plasma cells, more than one focal lesion, and free light chain elevation. This is a complicated slide, but I think it's important to highlight the complex interaction between the tumor cells and the bone marrow environment. And very interestingly, you can see on the bottom the osteoclast. That's the one that looks like the scrubbing bubbles guy that cleans out your, your, your shower. Um, the osteoclasts are responsible for nibbling away and clearing out old bone, and the osteoblasts are supposed to rebuild bone. What happens is there's an imbalance in the osteoclast stimulation without osteoblast building up of bone. So what, you, what happens is there's a lot of bone loss. In with that, you see the different chemicals and cytokines that are involved in further causing damage to one's body, such as the kidneys or other organs. Now, we'll go through today the different tests that are responsible for diagnosing myeloma, but the first very important one is called a serum protein electrophoresis or urine protein electrophoresis. Those monoclonal plasma cells will get flushed out into the urine in a majority of patients, so both tests are important. As you can see, the malignant plasma cells will make this clonal IgG kappa or IgA lambda, or maybe just serum-free light chains will be elevated in the blood or the urine. 
In this serum protein electrophoresis test, or urine, um, the proteins are pushed on a gel field, and sometimes the abnormal proteins will migrate into the beta region, as you can see these little purple cells are migrating there, or the gamma region. And again, this illustrates clonality. Now, of the patients that require treatment for multiple myeloma, it might be a period of one year, five years, or even 40 years before one requires treatment, but something happens, a terminal event where those cells are switched on, those clones are made, and then active myeloma occurs. Through a series of remissions and relapses, ultimately, the clones are different from that dominant clone that we started with. That bully in the playground that was causing all that trouble is gone, but it leaves space for other clones to emerge. And this sets the stage for continuous therapy, which is a standard of care in 2018 in managing myeloma, which we'll talk about. This slide highlights the different timeline in which drugs were approved. You can see 1958 was Melflan, which we still use today. There was a quiet period until the 2000s, which we have an explosion of new therapies in the last 15 years. Actually, 16 different indications now since the year 2000, which is amazing. And the good news is that the myeloma patients are living longer. This slide highlights the different subgroups, the non-Hispanic whites, the non-Hispanic blacks, and the Hispanic, those people that are sometimes left out of analyses to say it doesn't matter which year you were diagnosed, but you're living longer and getting benefit from these new agents. All right. Well, once a patient is diagnosed with active symptomatic multiple myeloma, we need to make the next decision. With what? What treatment are we going to use? As Dr. Feynman already said, there's a lot of treatment options for patients with multiple myeloma. When I did my dissertation at University of Washington, the first question of my mentor was that, if you're interested in treatment decision making, does patient with multiple myeloma have two or three or four options? And I said, yes. And then she said, okay, you're in. <laughs> so when there are two or more treatment options, it's important that we consider the model of evidence-based medicine which says there are three important factors in the treatment decision-making process for patients with cancer. Number one is the clinical experience of the clinician. Number two, what's the data from the research? And number three is patient preference. With that being said, let's move on to the dominant model now of our care delivery in patients diagnosed with cancer, and that is shared decision-making. This is such an important concept that the Oncology Nursing Society core curriculum actually added a whole chapter on communication and shared decision making, and this is going to be part also of the exam for ONCC for those of you. So this is really an important and growing um, topic in the field of oncology, and that is shared decision making. So let's, do with the, let's start with the basics. What is shared decision making? It, well, it is, a share, it is a care delivery model during cancer treatment decision encounter. And it has four essential elements. We can give credit to um, uh, Whelan and Gaffney, who are the pioneers in really identifying the construct of shared decision making. And in their model, the four essential things of shared decision making are, number one, there's two participants. Of course, the first party is the clinician, the healthcare provider, and the second party is the patient and the caregiver. Number two, the second essential of shared decision making is that both parties share information. Now, nurses are the most trusted professionals by patients. And nurses are also the most trusted source of information, according to the study that I've done about eight years ago. So we know that we can leverage the trust that, that our patients have on us to give them the information that they need in order to be active participants of shared decision making. The third essential is that both parties will take steps to build consensus about the preferred treatment. Now here's the kicker. 
Number four, the fourth essentials of shared decision making is mutual agreement is reached between the patient and the healthcare team on the treatment approach. Now, in theory, this is easy, and you would say this is so, um, can be implemented and can be realized or actualized in practice. Well, a lot of research has been done, and what we found out is that this fourth essential is actually the least accomplished of all the four essentials of shared decision making. We typically take, uh-huh, or I'm not saying anything, or the patient showed up in the clinic, that means that the patient agreed with the treatment. But actually, that is not considered as mutual agreement. That is considered as implicit. What the essentials of shared decision making really wants to see, to see is that there is explicit mutual agreement between the provider and the patient. So, I hope you'll get that in your post list. <laughs> so, myeloma patients want to participate in treatment decision making. This is one of the earliest studies that I've done in my doctoral study is that 95% of patients with multiple myeloma want to participate in the treatment decision making process. 19 out of 20 patients in my study for my dissertation. Only one patient said that I prefer to leave all treatment decisions to my provider. And this is a group of myeloma patients where the age range is from 62 to up to 82 with a median age of 73. And it really reflects the, pop the general population of patients newly diagnosed with multiple myeloma. So the new era of shared decision making is already here. We know that shared decision making provide benefits and the short-term benefits are here. It increased the confidence with treatment decisions. There's higher satisfaction with treatment decisions. We can measure this using the satisfaction with decision scale, the SWD. We also know that in the short term, it will enhance trust in the provider, us, improve self-efficacy, and then avoidance of decisional regrets which we can also measure using the uh, decisional regret scale, and then decrease patient caregiver stress and anxiety at the onset of the pressure in making that decision. What's the most important part, though, of shared decision making that I'd really like to emphasize is the long-term outcomes. We tend to not really appreciate this because, you know, it's too far away. But if you look at this closely, this is a very important outcome, and this is what we should really aim for all the time. Shared decision-making leads to better treatment adherence, and if the patient adheres to the treatment because they are part of the treatment, they explicitly agree with the treatment, what's going to happen is that they will be more adherent, they will not miss the appointment, and they will also be very uh, meticulous in taking their medications on time, on the dot, that leads to better response rate. And when a patient's in a better response, they'll have disease remission. remission. And when they're in remission, their symptoms and side effects are well managed, then they have an overall quality of life. And that's what we always want for our patients. So the Agency for Healthcare Research, or AHRQ, also recommends that we adapt shared decision making in our practices. And I think this is really important to highlight that nurses have a voice. As Dr. Terriman mentioned, patients will listen to us in many cases, not all of them, but in many cases. And so these step approaches, again, will help you to implement shared decision making in your practice just by having an open conversation and encouraging them to voice their opinion on what's important to them. So let's think about smoldering multiple myeloma. As we highlighted before, there is a group of patients that might not need treatment just yet, but they're going to hit that crab, that end organ damage that we worry about. There are some personalized evidence that is showing us that 
maybe not right now, but in the next couple of years, we'll be able to get that window of opportunity, involve the patients in a clinical trial if appropriate, to hopefully decrease their risk of getting organ damage, such as hypercalcemia, renal insufficiency, anemia, or bone damage. So this slide just looks at two different studies. MIC translocations are an oncogene that was first identified in Burkitt's lymphoma and lots of B-cell neoplasms. These researchers actually identified some new translocations that might make patients more, more likely to develop myeloma, which would encourage earlier treatment. And to the right hand of the slide, there is some next generation sequencing, some fancy looking at DNA within the bone marrow environment and identifying patients, again, at high risk for needing treatment sooner than later to prevent damage to one's body. This is a slide that just looks at two experimental approaches. Again, you can go to the myeloma matrix at the myeloma.org website. There's lots of clinical trials outlined for patients with smoldering myeloma. Again, we do not recommend treatment right now for smoldering myeloma only in the context of a clinical trial. But we do have two models of care. One is a curative model. Researchers in, in Spain and in the Spanish myeloma group looked at three drugs, carfilzomib, lenalidomide, and dexamethasone, followed by transplant, followed by more chemo, and then maintenance to really squash out those abnormal myeloma cells. That's a curative approach. Versus Dr. Hoffmeister's approach, which is single agent daratumumab. Again, we'll talk more about these drugs coming up. The key take home point of this, though, is that there are new treatments possibly available in the near future, and we'll find better ways to recommend them. So I think jo Joseph went into detail about how to use shared decision making. What is it? And there are some options for high dose, uh, high risk smoldering myeloma, again, involving the patient in their decision making listening to what's important to them, and helping them find a clinical trial if appropriate. 